Hi folks, it's Ron. Hey, welcome back to the channel and uh, part four of the uh, Residents of Network Cabling series that I'm trying to put up on the channel for you. And uh, in this session of the uh, of, of the series of videos we're putting out, it's going to be on, the, we're going to finish up coaxial cables and we'll talk a little bit about splitter basics and what to look for when buying splitters and the, what are you losing signal loss with the with them and the cabling and the connectivity. I'll also talk a little bit about the cable TV signals itself and what to, to know about it, what it's changed in it in the last 15, 20 years. And uh, we'll also do a very basic cable layout and design thing, what to think about again about where you amp and when don't you amp and where do you install modems and, and things like that. So uh, that's what we're going to take off on this series. And um, I'm going to turn you on to an organization, if you don't know them, called the Society of Cable Telecommunication Engineers, or the SCTE. Now, it only costs $50 to be a member, but you don't even have to be a member to get on their website. And if you want to figure out how to kill guys actually do what they do, well, this is who you're going to have to talk to. And uh, uh, their channel is very informative. And uh, one great thing about the SCTE is that they try to get a lot of good information out there about what should you buy, what should you buy as far as splitters and connectors and, and all that other stuff. And I'm going to tell you the bane to every cable company is homeowners running out and buying uh, low-end uh, passive devices like these splitters and hooking it up to their stuff and when it stops working they want to know why and it's because of things like this and I'm sure a lot of us have had, actually had the cable guy in the house and when he saw somebody else's connector or he saw another, somebody else's splitter in that building what did he do with it? He more than likely replaced it because he knows his that he carries on a truck are good and you cannot tell if these are and I don't care who, what they say or whose names on them and I always love things on packaging like that right there it says ultra pro grade and uh boy if you could find a standard for ultra pro grade i'd love to see it uh but there is no such thing and uh <clears throat> excuse me it's amazing how many people make bad buying decisions uh based on color of the splitters because they're gold and not silver looking and i'm telling you you're not gold plated either so uh, uh, so anyway, you cannot tell from the outside. So if you wanted to, you could go to their website and actually download the standard on passive devices like, like things like splitters and things like that. And it's not a huge document, but it would tell you exactly, you know, what the specs should be on a splitter that you're going to purchase and install in that system. So, um, uh, go check out the SCTE. Like I said, they're pretty good people. And one of the first things we'll talk about here are splitters themselves. A little bit about signal loss here and uh, what to look for when buying one. And uh, <clears throat> cable TV splitters have changed quite a bit over the years. And um, you got to understand the one on the left over here you see on the screen was made and designed back in the 50s and 60s, probably when everything in the world pretty much was analog only. Uh, no such thing as digital channels, and so what's one's drawback of these older splitters is they don't like to pass, sometimes at all, uh, ch digital channels. So there's one strike against them. So when you buy a splitter, the one on the right actually has a printed circuit board in it, and it will actually handle analog and digital, and those are the kind of things you want it to say on the splitter. I'm digital capable or HD TV capable or, you know, CATV compliant, all these kinds of words you might want to be looking for. <clears throat> now, the one on the left... Very simple in its design. Basically what they do, you're looking at a two-way splitter. and uh, So one of the ports is the input, the, the middle and the middle and their top. And what they'll do basically is very simply to solder two wires to it and, and wrap one of the conductors around that black little thing inside that's called a ferrite core. And it feeds out one of the inputs, or outputs I should say. The other wire wraps around that core and feeds the other output. And it's all that's in, it's in that two-way splitter, not much, right? Uh, so uh, those splitters, again, were really not designed for what's going on today. The other key thing that you're looking for in splitters is the terminology like bidirectional. Um, signals must pass both ways through these splitters today because that's how the modem, your set-top box, and those devices talk to the outside world. So it's important that, uh, that the device be capable of doing that. And there's another strike against these older type of splitters. And the one on the right is uh, analog and digital in nature and bidirectional. And then the other thing you're looking for on splitters here is the frequency range. And now, both splitters have the same low end of 5 megahertz, and uh, that number has always been 5 megahertz. Um, <clears throat> the upper number has changed over the years, and uh, this is the bandwidth or what we call the frequency range of the system. And uh, the larger that number is, or difference, is that it's the size of the pipe, folks. And so the bigger that range is, the bigger the pipe, more channels or information we could pass down the pipe. Now, you got to understand, back in the 70s, when we had 
30 channels, we ain't stuffing a whole lot down the pipe. Today, you know, we're stuffing a piece of coaxial cable like we never have, and there's literally hundreds and hundreds of channels being sent. So um, <clears throat> we need a pretty good-sized pipe. So back in the 70s, you could have got away with, oh, a two or 300 megahertz, per, uh, megahertz splitter and probably been okay. Uh, but uh, And you'll find a lot of splitters that still say 900 megahertz. That, that frequency range is pretty close to being adequate, but it's uh, a good sign to me that that's one of these older-looking splitters. When I see that on the splitter, and by the way, if you do not see any of these numbers or anything else on the splitter, good indication it's no good. Uh, what you want it to say is 1 gigahertz, and the one on the right is ready from 5 megahertz out to a gig, which is 1,000 megahertz, so 1 gig is just a fancy way to say 1,000. And uh, that is the frequency range you want the splitter to uh, have on it as well. So a few things to look at when you're buying that splitter. Now, um, why is that frequency range important? Well, you know, guess what frequency range your cable company is operating within today. And it's, uh, all, from what I know, all cable companies are operating somewhere under 1,000 megahertz in frequency. Um, in this chart, it goes out to 750, 860 megahertz. That's probably a typical range of most cable companies today. Uh, will the cable companies ever go out past a gig in frequency? And the answer to that is they can if they choose to. As long as they keep their signals on the cable, they can go out as high frequencies as they care to. And uh, um, at this point, they're not. But will they do that in the future? And I can almost bet they do because uh, as time goes on here, um, especially as we're trying to get uh, more and more high-speed stuff going on inside the homes, uh, they may have to go past that gig and frequency to make that happen. Now, if they, doubt, if they do this, uh, they're going to have to do a lot to upgrade their system. And again, the cable, the RG6, is capable of it. It's just that they would have to change out, again, any passive devices like splitters and amplifiers that weren't rated for that frequency. So at this point, they're not. Okay. Now, who else also likes to use this RG6 coaxial cables in the home? And that is the satellite guys. And when you look at RG6 and satellite frequencies within the home, well, on a satellite, there, it's a completely different frequency range. And uh, DBS down, or signals being beamed down through space to the side of the home, to the dish on the side of the home that's going to collect that signal, is pretty high. And then we have coax going off that into the home, okay, that, that is going to feed the satellite receivers and things like that. Uh, from that dish into the home on that coax, that satellite system is operating between 0 0.95 gig or 950 megahertz, and it goes out to a little past 2 gig in frequency over here on this left side here. So that's the frequency range of a satellite system in the home, really just kind of above where the cable TV guy left off. And uh, you'll find that RG6, depending on who makes it, uh, will be tested out to a frequency of usually about 2.2 gig, uh, upwards of usually out to about 3 gig in frequency. Uh, so there's a coax that, again, it can do everything the cable or the satellite guy actually throws at it. Okay. Now, this whole frequency thing I talk about. If you don't know, your set-top box from the cable company is very similar to a radio. It's basically going to... It knows what channel we put ESPN on or, or some other channel, you know, in, in, uh, CBS or whatever it is, and it can tune into that frequency and pull that video signal out of the cable and spit it out basically out into uh, channel 3 to your TV. So it's just like a radio if you want to think about it. You know, when you turn the knob on a radio, what are you actually doing? Well, you're obviously changing the frequency you're listening to and to a different radio station. So cable TV, kind of the same idea, same principle. It's just we're broadcasting uh, video here instead. So, uh, and traditionally back in the day when the cable company and everything was analog only, needed 6 megahertz of this to get you one channel. And I can't tell you where the cable companies start channel number one because they own these darn frequencies. They can put them where they want. And you know what? They're kind of secretive about where they put channels and uh, sometimes how they do and do what they do. But let's say they start channel number one at 54 megahertz. So between 54 and 60 megahertz is where we'd stuff channel number one. 60 uh, to 66 is channel number two. 66 to 72, channel number three. So if you take 860 megahertz in this case and divide it by basically six megahertz, how many analog channels could we stuff in the old pipe? Uh, it's about 135 over here. So um, that was like the max number of channels I could stuff in a pipe back when everything was analog. Well, today, as you know, a lot of things going on with the cable company is digital. And uh, it's interesting, they still utilize a six megahertz carrier wave but within that, they have uh, some a digital encoding they'll use called QAM modulation. And essentially, where they used to only get one channel, they might be getting a couple channels if it's just high def. 
uh, or if it's just standard definition, they might be able to get, I don't know, 10, 12 channels, who knows. And if it's like a music channel, something like that, that's really not a lot of content to it, they might be able to stuff a lot of channels in that frequency range. So be aware of it's a little mix of analog and digital in the cable industry. So, um, uh, so, um, uh, so it's interesting. Okay. So, and when you look at this frequency range here, uh, and you look at the loss in, in signals, and what, by the way, would go further here, uh, a cable, you know, a channel at the low end, the mid-range, or the high end, I mean, uh, what goes further down a channel, uh, down a cable, and the answer to that is uh, the lower channels do, the lower frequency stuff does. If you look at attenuation, we've talked about it before, two main causes, one is the length of the signal, or length of the wire, and the second one is the uh, frequency of the signal. Now, here's a typical cable attenuation chart for coaxial cable when we're going to look at the loss actually in the cabling here. And on the side of the chart, you see the frequency range of 5 up to 1,000 megahertz, which is the frequency we're operating within. Then across the top of the chart there, you see the different types of coaxial cable you can buy. And, uh, and it will give you the typical loss in a 100-foot length of cable here. So all these numbers on the chart represent a 100-foot length of cable and the loss in the cabling. And uh, if R you see RG59, you see a column for RG6, uh, you notice there is no column for quad because they have the same center conductors, basically the same loss. RG7, uh, RG11 might be a cable you'll find in the backyard. Their cable companies are running between pedestal to pedestal. And uh, as we get beyond that, uh, into 500 and beyond here, we get into what they refer to as hardline coax, and it's very tough, durable, hard cable. Uh, pain the strip and all that kind of good stuff, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, this into a thousand. This this cable represents basically it's an inch in diameter, and it's got huge you know quarter inch hollow tubes in it for center conductors. It's just big big cable. It's something you'll never find in a home, but a very low loss wire. So again, uh, we got to go long distance. Maybe we'll just go to a bigger bigger conductor. So or cabling itself. All right. So if we look specifically at RG six, and I got highlighted here at fifty five megahertz. If we broadcasted a channel at 55 megahertz, you scroll over to RG6, what this chart tells you is that you will lose about 1.5 dB of signal uh, every 100 foot in that length of cable. And I'll talk a little bit more about the dB in a minute, but uh, uh, it's just a unit of measurement. We call it a decibel. Okay? Now, on the high end of this chart, let's say in the middle of the night, the, t the uh, cable guys decide to reprogram that channel to broadcast at 870 megahertz. Well, you scroll over from this chart uh, for 870, and it says 6.1 dB. So now we've lost quite a bit more signal in that length of cable, okay? Uh, so, uh, and it's interesting, uh, I think I told you in another uh, portion of this that most cases we do not measure signal strength in coax. We just look for over, opens and shorts in the cable while we're installing it. And dB loss meters to actually measure signal loss at a uh, certain frequency, uh, cheap ones can run three, four hundred bucks, which usually only check the low end, can't really check the high end and what's going on out there. Uh, something that does that might be somewhere between a thousand and maybe fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars. And that's the type of meter the cable guy might be carrying with him. And uh, most of us are not carrying, you know, fifteen hundred dollar testers around to see if this we've got a signal at a, at a TV, which, you know, obviously plug the TV in the outlet, see. Um, but I tell guys, you can guesstimate loss and start spotting when you are going to be running into probs pretty quickly. And what I will tell you that if you looked at a mid-range frequency in the cable industry today, it's about 400 megahertz. You scroll over on this chart from 400 megahertz, it says 4 dB in RG6. So I'm going to tell you 100 foot length of RG6 loses roughly 4 dB of signal. Okay, And, you know, there's going to be times when I'm going to be a little high on that number and sometimes I'm going to be a little low on that number, but rough guess. So... If 100 foot loses 4 dB, how much do you think 50 feet loses? And if you were guessing 2, you'd be correct. And, of course, 200 foot's going to lose more like 8. So that's how we can go about figuring out, do we have a signal at the end of the day, or what are we actually losing in the cabling itself? So um, so it's interesting on this on this frequency range you see from the cable company here, from 5 up to 860 megahertz, you know, they ne basically never wanted to put any channels out toward the high side of this frequency range because they know those channels at those frequencies will be weaker when they get to an outlet in the room than other channels, okay? And, uh, and if the high end, you know, if the low end goes so much further than the high end, guess where the return path is in a cable TV system? Where does your set-top box, your cable modem typically talk to the outside world and it would be in what they call their T-channels, which is on the down, on the low end side of this frequency range. 
And, um, you know, it's interesting. If you ever look at a cable TV lineup and you look at uh, what channels they put where and look at what the what channels they put way out on the high end and you'll find it's things like music channels and stuff like that. And they're thinking you may not be too mad at them if you can't uh, listen to Beethoven today, but uh, if you can't watch the, the, the big game or whatever it might be, you know, you might be pretty mad. So, um, and by the way, when things go bad here, uh, which end of the spectrum do you lose first signal wise is going to be the high end so uh, uh, but again they're running out of room they're having to put those channels someplace in that setup so uh, that's a little bit about where cable TV puts channels and why they do and what frequencies they're operating within okay now the next slide here is going to mention a two gigahertz plus type splitter I just told you the cable companies are not operating above a gig in frequency uh, at this point in time. So buying a 2 gig splitter, is it actually going to help you any? And for cable TV systems, the answer is no. Doesn't hurt you none. <laughs> uh, but at this point in time, it really didn't really help you much here. So um, buying 2 gig splitters, well, you certainly can. Uh, they're not going to help, help you with a whole lot with cable TV signals, just be aware of it. And um, for splitter applications, uh, you know, the, 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 the splitter does, or does say something about satellite applications. I'm going to tell you, in most cases, we do not split satellite signals, okay? Now, uh, I will back off of that a little bit. In the last couple, three years, uh, some companies out there have developed some new, what are called uh, uh, switches, multi-switch or swim switches, they call them, that you might be able to use a splitter. Uh, and there are some applications where you could potentially use a splitter in satellite systems. But as a general no. Uh, they usually use what are called multi-switches, and these are devices that are basically look like a splitter sometimes, but they're not, okay? And I won't get into them at this point in time, but uh, as a general rule, we don't use splitters on satellites, folks. So, uh, But uh, um, uh, go to your satellite company, get the right product to do that with you. If you're not wanting to add a, another uh, satellite dish to, you know, another room or something, okay? Surge protection on splitters. And here's another thing you'll find I'm not real high on. Um, we generally tell you don't be putting surge protection on splitters, on coax because it can potentially f filter channels on the, on the, on them. So uh, they like to think if we properly ground that cable as it comes in the building, we shouldn't have to worry about putting surge on the coax itself. Now surge protection on the power outlet for the set top box, yes, uh, but not on the coax per se. And uh, but um, if you do do it, just you might check with your cable companies and see what your local cable company is recommending there. But uh, you can buy splitters with surge protection on. Uh, and when we look at basic loss in splitters, it's, it's obviously pretty basic. If you take a, a signal coming into a two-way splitter, uh, essentially the two-way splitter chops that signal in half. And half the signal comes out one port, half the signal comes out the other port. And so uh, uh, it's going to take whatever it sees and chops it in half. Now you still get the 5 to 1 gig frequency range. It's just you're going to get half the power, okay? And I actually run across some folks that think that, boy, if you don't use that port, all that energy goes to that other port. And the answer to that is no, you've lost it. So um, that's why I say if you need a two-way, don't buy a four-way because, again, you're just splitting it even more than that. Now, better quality splitters will typically have a number on it, the port, and it's a representation of, how, uh, of the signal loss at the port. And on two ways, you'll typically see numbers like, I don't know, 3.4, 3.5, or 3.7. And by the way, if they don't put a number on the port, that's a good indication. Maybe that's not the best quality splitter to be buying. And, um, you know, um, you almost have to ask the splitter manufacturer, what frequency did you measure that at? Uh, and But if you read the standard on a splitter, it will tell you that on a two-way splitter, that loss uh, at that port cannot be more than 4 dB over the entire 1 gig frequency range. So I know, according to the standards, it can't be more than 4. So I'm just going to round that, up, that number up to 4 dB and tell you that all... Two ways lose roughly 4 dB per port, okay? And again, we'll explain the whole dB thing in, in a little bit. All we're going to do is add and subtract the dBs to figure out how much signal we have at the end of the day. Uh, so, and kind of what the numbers mean to you, by, by the way, too. Um, when I tell you you have zero dB signal in the cable TV industry, that does not mean no signal. Basically, that's a point they measure up and down from in their system. And in their industry, 3 dBs represents the doubling or halving in power. So... Uh, a 3 dB gain is a doubling in power. A 3 dB loss is a halving. 6 dB, you're four times hotter than you were. A 6 dB drop means you've got a fourth remaining. 10 dB, you're 10 times hotter than you were. And a 10 dB drop means you've got a tenth remaining. So that's kind of what the, the numbers mean to you here. And um, 
So we know, going back to that splitter, that it's losing at least 3 dB because it's going to take the signal and chop it in half. Now, there is also something what's referred to as an insertion loss, which is the loss due to the splitter itself. And so we know it's over 3, and I know it can't be more than 4, but uh, that's kind of what the numbers mean to and represent to us uh, when we look at and say it's 3 dB a loss or something like that. Okay? Now, that's a basic two-way splitter. Okay? Now, a three-way splitter is pretty much like a uh, two two-way splitters hooked together, actually. You take an incoming signal coming into the three-way splitter. They're going to split it once internal to that three-way. One of the ports on the three-way gets roughly 50% of whatever came in the front door. And again, I don't know how much that was. Now, in order to make those other two ports on a three-way, we're going to throw another two-way splitter in there internal to the three-way and create those other two ports. So you'll see in the diagram here, I've labeled the ports as 4 dB, 8 dB, and 8 dB. So one of the ports again got about 50% of whatever came in the front door. The other two are getting a, a basically a quarter of whatever came in the front door. And those other ports have doubled in loss, roughly. And so the long front in the house on a three-way splitter would go with the one with the lowest number on it, which is an indication of, again, the loss at the ports. A lot of people look at those ports and see 4, 8, and 8, or 3.7 and... 7.4, 7.4 say, and they think the bigger numbers are better, and so they'll put the longer runs on those. So that's it's actually the opposite of that. And a four-way splitter is actually created by actually taking three two-ways and hooking them together. So they take an incoming signal, hit a two-way splitter, and then each of those outputs will hit another two-way splitter, getting us the four outputs on the splitter. So you essentially, on a four-way splitter, taking a signal and chopped it into four. So all ports are getting a roughly eight or losing roughly eight dB of signal. And so uh, all four-ways lose roughly eight dB per port. And uh, if you need to make bigger splitters for whatever reason and you can't find one in stock or something, you can always cascade splitters together and create as big a splitter as you want. You just got to make sure you have enough signal at the end of the day to make the TV work. And uh, so in this case here, we're showing a two-way, a little bit of coax, feeds two four-way splitters that creates basically an eight-way splitter. And by cascading them together here, uh, we can make a bigger splitter. And essentially, that's exactly what they did internal to an eight-way splitter, if you bought just an eight-way splitter. And if we look at system loss here, uh, we know the two-ways lose about 4 dB on a port. Uh, the coax, I'm not going to count between the two splitters or three splitters because, you know, this is like a foot long. I'm not going to worry about length. And so, uh, and the four ways lose basically eight dB. So uh, the two way loses four, the eight ways lose four. You add up the loss, all the runs through these ports. Each each port is dropping about twelve dB a signal. And uh, you know, people ask all the time, "Is that going to work if I do that?" And the answer is, you. I don't know. You'd have to go home and try it. It actually has obviously something to do with the signal strength coming into the side of the home. And it actually has something to do with the TV you own, too. So a lot of us don't realize that, but the tuner in the TV has something to do with this as well, So, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, okay? So there's signal loss and splitters, okay? And, of course, the bigger, more splits you go through, the, that even gets worse and worse and worse. Now, another interesting thing that we do today that we really haven't done in the past are use what are called termination caps on cable TV systems. And... Uh, they're recommending to us that this is not a bad idea today. And uh, they're basically telling you that if you have a piece of coax running through a building and that one end is hooked into a splitter, but you're not using, say, the outlet in the room, uh, we'd ask you to cap that, that outlet in the room that's not being used with a termination cap. Now, if you have any ports on your splitter that are not being used, uh, we'd ask you to cap those as well. And uh, essentially, we're doing this for several reasons. And one is the frequency... the uh, Cable TV companies are using those higher frequencies like they never have in the past. Those channels we know are going to be weaker by the time they get to an outlet because of the loss in the signals. Uh, so they're more susceptible by the time they get to this outlet. And so noise interference can cause problems here. And if the wires in a wall uh, is, is not being used and you have it hooked into, say, like a splitter, uh, those wires are essentially antennas. And it's, they can pick up stray noise and frequencies out of the air uh, you can be vacuuming next to this thing and get some EMI interference, or you might be living down the street from a radio station that broadcasts lots of RF or a TV station that broadcasts, again, a lot of RF, and get interference problems. And um, one of the big problems, though, that they want to eliminate here is that the blue signal is passing down this cable is a representation of a good signal traveling on a piece of coax. Now, that... Uh, Open, and it's, by the way, going down a cable, that's what's referred to as 75 ohms of impedance. You've heard me mention that. 
how many ohms is the open? And the answer to that is it's a hundred. It's a it's a an infinity. It's a bunch. It's an open circuit, right? So this energy, if you remember your high school physics, is traveling on this cable and ain't disappearing. When it hits that uh, brick wall of energy of, of of resistance, so to speak, that energy goes someplace, and what it does is it reflects and back. It, it, it becomes what we refer to as a standing wave, and uh, it's like me taking a tennis ball again and throwing it at an outlet or at a wall. When the energy in that ball hits that wall. That energy is going someplace, and again, it reflects. And so that standing wave is equal to uh, the incoming signal strength-wise. It becomes what we call out of phase with it. And, you know, older analog stuff, that could cause ghosting and distortion problems. And the new digital stuff basically can cause pixelation problems. So uh, we want to eliminate this whole reflected energy we can. And we do that by utilizing termination caps. Now, Inside that cap, very simple thing. What's inside that cap is a 75 ohm resistor, and it's essentially going to put a 75 ohm load across the cable. Between the center conductor and the shielding in that cable, it throws a 75 ohm load across it. Now, that little resistor in that cap is going to absorb that energy, and it's then going to dissipate that energy in the form of heat, and this will never get hot of the touch. Uh, we're talking very low, low power stuff. If you've ever dealt with cable TV signals in the home, you'll find that if you touch the center conductors, do you feel anything? And uh, the answer is no, because these guys are working in millivolts of signal strength, so thousands of a volt. So very low power stuff, but very high frequency stuff. So uh, termination caps are just one more thing that uh, we're beginning to say, you know, that's not a bad idea if we're trying to keep a tight cable plant inside of a building so we don't get energy either in going into or out of uh, our systems. Now... When you sit down and want to figure out how the cable guy's designing a cable TV system, um, that's what I'm going to do next. And essentially, we're going to look at the input stage of the equation and figure out how much signal is coming into the side of the building uh, or the home. And then we're going to look at what you're losing in the house between the splitters and the connectivity and the cabling, all kind of good stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what you ought to have at an outlet in the room when you get done. And if you know these basic numbers, you can figure out do I quickly have a problem here or not. Now, uh, I will turn you on to a great little company if you don't know who that is, and that's uh, down over in a corner called Blonder Tongue. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Blonder Tongue, their website's very informative. And guess, by the way, who invents the cable TV amplifier? And uh, that would be Mr. Blonder and Mr. Tongue. And so they've been around in the industry for a long time. And so very informative. Matter of fact, you give them your name and information, they'll let you download a reference CD, which is packed with great information about how they do what they do. So... And essentially what we're going to do is, when you look at uh, that little green box that sits in the pedestal in the backyard, if you ever open up one of these pedestals, uh, you'll see something in there that looks kind of like a splitter, but it's not. It's referred to as a directional coupler, or what a guy in the field would call a tap. And I tell guys that there's two basic ways of distributing video signals, and one is with splitters, and that's what we use at home because it's the cheapest way to do it. And the other way is with uh, uh, taps like this. And I tell guys, if you ever want to do like an apartment complex or campus environment or something much, much bigger than a single family home, <clears throat> you need to understand how to design and use taps. And if you can add and subtract, I'd like to think you can figure out how to use a tap. It's not all that hard. And again, Blonder Tongue would uh, give you some insights as to how to actually design and use taps. But we're going to use splitters in this case, okay? And uh, a homework assignment for you guys is always to go home and Google the good old decibel and figure out uh, what the signal loss is going on inside these systems. And uh, uh, the true dB is a power ratio, as I think I've mentioned before. And uh, the little meter the cable TV guy carries out with him is called a dB per millivolt meter. And uh, uh, there are like nine variations of the dB, but uh, one of them is a dB per millivolt. And... Uh, through good old Ohm's law, you could equate voltage to power, and uh, that changes our equation over here a little bit. But uh, trust me, a little meter the guy carries out the house with is called a dB per millivolt meter. And the reason I want you to know this is that all TVs are designed to see a certain uh, uh, signal strength rise. So all TVs have a tuner, and that tuner has a certain uh, input range it's designed to see signal strength wise. And... Uh, you know, it's interesting, if you go home tonight and you look at the little booklet they gave you or look on the back of the TV, and you'll never find this number. And they give you all kinds of numbers, but why don't they give you this one? And uh, you got to understand that people who manufacture TVs, they don't essentially make this one model and sell it to everybody. They might be able to make variations of that depending on a price point. And, uh, you know, if you ever go out and buy a, a nice TV someplace and then you go... Uh, <clears throat> and it's two thousand bucks, and you go from someplace else and find it for, you know, four or five hundred bucks cheaper. You know, how do we hit those price points? And uh, believe it or not, the manufacturers can cheapen the devices uh, inside the, the TVs to 
hit price points. And so scalers and tuners are all different things we can change. So, um, and we basically have two basic TVs left over still in this world. We got the old cathode ray tube TVs, which is the old heavy duty, um, um, you know, analog only type TVs that uh, essentially we were trying to get rid of, but those things were designed in a time frame when we meant them to last 30 and 40 years. So they're going to be around a while. And I would tell you an old TV like that would like to see typical input range 5 to 15 dBmV. Now, uh, and under 5, it, we, the old analog would just fade out. Uh, above 15, it starts to become what we call grainy TV pictures. Uh, have you ever seen colors smearing a TV? You're overdriving an old analog, and uh, you can actually make a TV go completely white uh, with the old analog. It was too much, so you actually blinded it with too much. Uh, and the new digital ones are a little more sensitive. Now, <clears throat> partly because the cable companies, when you look and see how they send a digital versus an analog channel, they can actually get away running those digital channels about 10 dB lower in power and still make things happen. So typical tuners have to be a little more sensitive today. So, And I understand a really good TV today can see anywhere from a range of minus 20 to plus 20. But I also know there's a bunch of TVs out there that won't see anywhere near that range. And so we will tell you a typical input range on a TV today is somewhere between minus 10 and plus 5 dBmV, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> typical TV. Now, over here on the side, uh, it states that the FCC uh, says to the cable companies, hey, if I took a meter and measured the signal strength at the outlet in a room, uh, how, many, how many dB should that be at an outlet in a room? The answer is 0 dB, okay? And why'd they pick 0 dB? And the reason they pick 0 dB is if we look at uh, new TVs, that's really in the wheelhouse of a brand new TV. And um, now every outlet in every room is going to get a different number because every length of every outlet is all cable length wise is all different lengths. So every room gets a different number. So uh, my target typically is 0 to 5 in an outlet is what I'm going to tell you. I probably ought to have fallen out of an outlet in a room. Okay, So that's kind of our number we want to see falling out of the outlets in the room, 0 to 5. Now, it's interesting over here on the side, the FCC also tells Mr. Cable Company, what's the minimum they got to give you on the side of a home? And the answer to that is three. Now, cable companies know if they only gave you three dB, and then you start splitting it, especially multiple times, you more than likely aren't going to have zero dB at an outlet in a room. So, they give us typically a lot more than three dB because uh, they know that a lot of us would, would go out and buy things like amplifiers, especially the, you know, we'll buy the older ones, which are less money, not a, a digital, you know, one gig rated amplifier kind of thing, which you should have today if you're going to try and do this. Um, uh, you'll buy those cheap ones and cause them nothing but problems. So they typically give us a lot more than that on the side of a home, but that's all they've got to give you, okay? And what we're going to do here is we're going to figure out the signal loss going on, and we're going to look at what goes through the, the splitters and the and the cables and, and all that kind of stuff, and we're going to look at the attenuation system. And again, since all outlets will be getting a different number, 0, 05 is kind of the number we're, we're going to be looking for. But just keep in mind, older TVs, will you typically need a little more signal, and uh, newer TVs can typically get by on a little less signal, okay? And we know some things. We know two-way splitters lose 4 dB roughly. We know four-ways lose roughly 8. Uh, Twelve, well, four, Eight-way would lose 12. You know, a 100-foot length of cable load loses roughly 4 dB. Um, mated connections, which I usually don't add into these equations, you might throw a half a dB for mated connections, but again, there shouldn't be a whole lot of connections in this run, or really just one on either end. Um, so the number we don't know is this, what is the number on the side of the home. So if you called up the cable company and said, hey, what's the number on the side of my home, more than likely the customer service person is going to have no idea. Uh, but they'll go, wait a minute, let me send a signal out to the home, and they what they call ping the set-top box, or in other words, they send a signal out to it. They, they get that back. They'll go, hey, I don't know what the number it is, but it's working. So if you don't have a 1,500 dB loss meter to actually take this measure on the side of the home, which you more than likely don't, um, call up the cable, co uh, disconnect your coax, then call up your cable company, and uh, when they can't ping their set-top box, uh, then they might run a guy out there with a truck to actually maybe uh, give you a measurement for you. And uh, um, I don't know if you've upset this guy a whole lot, but, uh, you know, other than, without having a meter, that's the only way to know for sure the number. Okay, folks? So I've done quite a bit of work over the years trying to figure out what this number is supposed to be on the side of the home. And it's interesting. What I found out was they didn't have a number for it. And I said, that's crazy. you got to have a, a number for what we want on a typical side of a home. 
And the reason they don't is because uh, all the runs or the drops off these taps in the backyard, off those pedestals, are all different lines. So again, every house gets a different number. So, but I did find out that they do have a number typically coming off a tap. And uh, I typically hear 18 to 20 dB coming off the tap. And um, so, for instance, in this example here, we've got several homes here. The shortest run is a 50-foot run off that tap. So that RG6 in that shortest run is losing somewhere around 2 dB. So that customer's getting around 16. A uh, 100-foot run off the tap is losing more like 4. I and mean, that customer over there is getting about 14 dB of signal. Um, and you'll find they don't like to go more than about two or 250 feet off a tap. And uh, so that longest run, that 200 foot, is losing roughly 8 dB of signal. So it's getting somewhere around 10 dB. So 10 to 15 is kind of a good rough number to guess on the side of a home. But there's all kinds of reasons why it couldn't, wouldn't be 10 to 15. And uh, one is, you know, that wire's been in the ground for 25 years. Yeah, it's probably losing more than you think it is. Um, Maybe you like to weed whack that cable as it comes up to the side of the house every every week when you mow the yard. Ain't helping it none. You're damaging the cable slightly. You nicked it someday. Or worst are probably landscapers. They dig a hole in the backyard and they put a tree where you told them to. Did they tell you to cut the cable in half? And, of course, the answer is probably no. They probably splice the cable and put it back in the ground. And, uh, um, and they normally don't put heat shrink or nothing else on it either. So... Um, and, and so, uh, uh, and by the way, um, um, if you called up the cable company, Mr. Landscaper, and asked them to come out and fix this, they're probably going to want money to fix it. So they are, by the way, are not going to splice it. They're going to pull new wire off the tap and charge that landscaper a couple hundred bucks, more than likely. So uh, a lot of reasons why it may not be 10 to 15, but that's kind of the number. Now, the reason they chose 10 to 15 on the side of a home is because they looked at their customer base and they said, okay, typical cable TV customer. What's the max number of set-top boxes? Most of them don't go past, and the number came back at 4 dB. Uh, I mean, at, at 4 set-top boxes. So that means that, you know, you use a four-way splitter. Well, we know four-ways lose about 8 dB. So um, uh, if you had 15 dB coming inside of the building and you hit a four-way splitter, it loses 8. That gets you down to roughly 7 dB. you got another 100-foot runs out to, a, say, an outlet, that was another, say, roughly 4 dB in a 100-foot run. So that's a, a 12 dB drop. You had 15. So that means you got about 3 dB falling out of the outlet room. You're, you're golden, right? You're in your 0 to 5 like we want to be. And if they gave us 10 on the side of a home, again, a four-way splitter is losing about 8 of it. And most single-family runs are probably in that 50, 40, 50, maybe 60-foot range. It's losing about 2. So you got 8 dB loss with the splitter four-way. Uh, you've got 2 dB loss in the coax. It's 10 it had 10 coming in, so that's about 0 dB at an outlet, and so that's still within our specification of 0 to 5. So this is why I've assumed 10 to 15 on the side of a home, okay? And if I would look at a typical cable TV setup and what might go on as far as uh, how they might, you know, splitters and, and modems and things like that in a building, the cable company, if you have phone and high-speed internet from them, is going to want to install a modem in the home as well. Now, they normally mount these wherever it's convenient to them. And uh, uh, where we typically like to put it would be wherever the low voltage panel is that we're going to mount in the building, okay? So if you can imagine, all of this right here is sitting in my low voltage panel. And so we come from the outside of the building, we're out cable into the building where our panel's going to set, go into the panel, and the first thing we hit is a two-way splitter inside the panel. Now half that two-way will feed the modem, okay? Now off the modems are phone lines and high-speed internet lines. Now... The phone line typically would get ran into a phone board inside the low voltage panel that we could then split out to any phone we might want inside the, the home. And the high speed internet would then go right to our router uh, or switch that would then take that to, again, uh, any computer we might need uh, in the home. So again, that modem typically hopefully is inside of our low voltage panel or, or right next to it. And uh, the other half, the two way in the panel, they can then feed a larger splitter that then can feed all the TVs with uh, uh, video signals, okay? And if I look at numbers on this drawing, say we got 15 dB coming in the side of the building, and I know there's some loss coming from the side of the house to the input of that two-way, but let's say we got 15 dB coming into the input on the two-way. The two-way, that first leg of it that feeds the modem, is going to lose roughly 4 dB. So uh, that, and I'm not going to count the loss in the coax between the two-way and the modem because, again, it's three feet long. It's in the panel. Um, so that modem's getting roughly 11 dB, say, which, from what I know, is plenty. Now, 
you have two, 15 coming into the two-way on the input stage, that other leg of that two-way also loses 4 dB. And hence, that four-way splitter in a panel that feeds the other TVs is getting now roughly 11 dB as well. They're both getting 11 dB here. This is like water pressure, if you want to think of it, okay? Um, and so uh, now we know the four-way loses roughly 8 dB. We know a 50-foot run out to an outlet's going to lose roughly 2 dB. So that's a 10 dB lo loss between the splitter and the uh, outlet, uh, run out to the outlet. We had 11 come into the four-way splitter. So we got about 1 dB falling out of the outlet in the room. We're, we're golden again. We're in our 0 to 5 range. Don't need to amp any of this if we didn't want to, okay? Um, so, but, you know, if you do need to amp signals for whatever reason, just make sure you buy a good quality amplifier that's rated for today. And uh, just amp up whatever loss you're trying to overcome from just excessive length of cables or maybe you split it more than you, you should have kind of thing. So buy an amplifier rated for what you want to do and make sure they're, they're analog and digital in nature. Make sure they're bi-directional. They're rated up to one gig in frequency and all these wonderful things we want uh, that, that amplifier to be. Now, keep in mind that they increase signal strength. They, uh, uh, they will amp any noise they see too, so be aware of that. So uh, you always want to make sure you're amping a good signal. And as a general rule, I will tell you, Amplifiers as they are designed to amp zero dB signals and above. Really can't take a minus 20 or a minus 30 type dB signal and actually amp it properly. So uh, again, you only look for terms like you know, ready for cable TV applications or HD TV ready you know, capable of bidirectionals or all things we're looking for on on the amplifier before we go buy one. Now, if you in this example here, here's an example where we got basically the same setup, but we're going to try and feed. 12 outlets in the building, okay? And you'll see on some of these runs, these are 200 footers. So there's some pretty long runs here. And the rest of all the runs are say 400 feet or, or less. So in this setup, what I did was there was a, a eight long run or eight short runs and, and four long runs. So I batched the long runs together through a four way splitter and the eight shorter runs through an eight way splitter. And then I fed both those two splitters back into a two way and then the incoming signal from the outside of the building. So if we come from the outside of the building, we got 15, say, coming in. We know, again, in that two-way, that first leg is going to lose 4 dB. So here are our input, our amplifier, we're going to install inside here before the splitter that feeds the uh, different TVs is getting somewhere around 11 dB. Now, I'm going to tell you, as a general rule, never amp the signals going into modems. Uh, as, a, as a general rule, a lot of the, mo the amplifiers aren't capable of doing that. And uh, it's not, you couldn't. Uh, you just have to make sure you have a good quality amp uh, amplifier to do that. But as a general rule, don't amp the signals to the modems. Which is why I'm not amping this going into the two way splitter. Okay? All right. Uh, that is the first two, I should say. So uh, here we're going to amp that signal. Now, we know that uh, we're losing uh, quite a bit of signal. So. Um, like, for instance, on the 200-foot runs, we're losing about 8 dB. The four-way split loses about 8 dB. So that's a 16 dB drop. Plus, you got a, a, a 4 dB drop going through that second two-way splitter. So there's a, a 20 dB drop. Uh, so uh, if we put an amp in line here and we amp the signal output to be 25 dB, we know that those long runs, we'd have about 5 dB falling on the outlet room. Okay? And on the uh, shorter runs, there's more of them, and those 100-foot runs only lose about 4, but since I batched them through an 8-way splitter, which has more loss, it has 12 dB of loss, you can see, and of course the 2-way splitter here has about another 4 dB, there's about a 20 dB drop there in those runs as well. So all the outlets are getting somewhere around 5 dB a signal. Okay? So that's how we go about figuring out how big of an amplified buy to this thing, is to figure out you know, what the input stage coming in, uh, what you're losing in the house, and then subtract the two, and you got a rough idea of, do I need a 10 dB amp, 15 dB amp, you know, what am I going to need in order to amp this and make sure everything's working the way it's supposed to. Now, you will run into situations where you, you say you, you only got four runs in the house, but one of them is feeding a barn out on a backyard or a pool house out there someplace, and that run is, you know, 300 foot away, and all the other ones are, you know, 50 feet or, or 100 foot or less. You know, you can amp after a splitter, and that would be the place to amp a signal like that. It would be right after, the, say, the four-way splitter. So you'd come into the side of the building, hit the four-way splitter, 
and and then uh, off the output of the one that feeds that long run, amp it right there as it comes out of that that four way splitter. You would want to try and amp it at it, you know at the end of that three hundred foot run because then you're going to again be amping a, a crappy signal. And the reason you don't want to amp is because you can overamp, as we mentioned a minute ago, and uh, you don't want to overamp necessarily an outlet room either, and uh, so uh, and you can obviously coil up wires and throw a splitter in that run. You can do things to drop it down. They actually sell attenuators, which you can screw in line with coax and drop it down in case you have an outlet that actually is being overdriven. You can always buy uh, amplifiers that are amplifier slash splitters, and you can amp each output differently, and that obviously costs more money. So there's a lot of ways around that, but the simplest thing usually is typically just amp the one run that needed it. Uh, and not amp all runs in the house. So again, you can amp as anywhere you want as long as you got a good signal. And again, as I said a minute ago, zero dB and above is kind of the number I'll tell you. Okay. So uh, those are some uh, insights as to what, how the cable TV f guys figure out: Do I have enough signal? Don't I have enough signal? Kind of thing. And uh, hopefully that answered a lot of your questions on that kind of stuff. Hey, uh, do me a favor, go check out the channel uh, if you get a chance, and, and um, I appreciate you all uh, subscribing to that channel. And if I can ever be of service, certainly give me a holler, okay? Hey, thanks for watching the channel, folks. Again, I'm Ron with Ideal Industries, and I'll plan on seeing you in the next one.